number theory, you study divisibility a lot. And one of the reasons for this is a result we call the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Basically, this says that every positive integer greater than one can be factored into a product of prime numbers in a unique way. For example, six is two times three, 10 is two times five, 17 is prime, so it's just 17. You can't break it up into smaller prime numbers. And when we say that an integer can be factored in a unique way, we have to be a little bit careful here. For example, look at 12. 12 is two times two times three. Now, someone else might write it as two times three times two, or maybe three times two times two. These all give the same thing. So you'll often hear the phrase unique up to order. What that means is if you don't worry about the order of the primes, then the factorization into prime numbers is unique. With that in mind, it's kind of natural to say, okay, let's start looking at these integers to see if there's any pattern to them. You have some numbers like 13, prime numbers, where the only divisors are one in itself. In fact, that's one way you could define a prime number, an integer that's only divisible by one in itself. There are other ways to define prime numbers. By the way, there's one exception to this definition. We don't consider one to be a prime number. It's not a prime even though it's divisible by one in itself. We call one a unit, and we'll explore that later. So we have prime numbers like 13. Then you have numbers like 24. It's not prime. It can be factored as two times two times two times three. Because it's not prime, we call it composite. Now, if you were to look at the numbers that divide 24, there's quite a few of them. There's one, two, three, four, six, eight, 12, and 24. So it has eight divisors. A divisor is a number that divides another number evenly. Literally one third of the integers from one to 24 divide it evenly. So with that in mind, what we would like to do today is explore how divisible an integer is. And to do that, we're gonna be using certain terms and notations frequently. So let's go ahead and talk about those. We say if x divides y evenly, then x is a divisor of y, and we write it like this. For example, three is a divisor of 12, and five is a divisor of 25. Now seven is not a divisor of 40. So in that case, you put a little slash through the vertical line to indicate that it is not a divisor. So how can we measure how divisible an integer is? In number theory, the way you do this is you use a function that kind of counts or quantifies integers based on their divisors. These kinds of functions are often called number theoretic functions. You might even hear the phrase arithmetic functions. One common number theoretic function is the sigma function, which is also called the divisor function. It's defined to be the sum of all integers that divide an integer. For example, sigma of eight would be one plus two plus four plus eight, which is 15. Another arithmetic function is the tau function. This is the number of divisors, not the sum of the divisors, but just the number of divisors. For example, tau of eight is four because there are four divisors, one, two, four, and eight. Tau of 12 would be six because there are six divisors, one, two, three, four, six, and 12. And tau of any prime number P is two because the only integers that divide a prime number are one in itself, P. For historical reasons, we're gonna focus on a third function, S of n. This is the sum of all proper divisors of the integer n. A proper divisor is an integer less than n that divides n, so it's any divisor other than n. We'll start with two. S of two equals one, because if you look at the proper divisors of two, there's just one. Remember, we're not counting the number itself. S of three is also one, S of four is one plus two, which is three. S of five is one. Notice that S of P is one for any prime number P. S of six is one plus two plus three, which is equal to six. S of seven is one. S of eight is one plus two plus four, which is seven. And we can continue. Now in ancient times when Euclid was around, there was this tendency towards numerology people thought there was a mystical importance to some numbers. And they noticed that there was something special about the number six. The sum of its proper divisors was six. And then they looked at 28 and the sum of its proper divisors, one, two, four, seven, 14, is also 28. And the numbers six and 28 are important to people for other reasons. 
For example, it was believed the universe was created in six days. And 28 is roughly the number of days it takes the moon to orbit the Earth. They put a lot of significance on those numbers. They called those perfect numbers. So people broke all the integers up into three different categories. If the sum of the proper divisors is less than the number, we call it a deficient number. If the sum of the proper divisors is larger than the number, we call it an abundant number. And if the sum of the proper divisors is equal to the number itself, we call it a perfect number. This raises a few interesting questions. One is, how many integers are there in each of these three categories? Is there an infinite number? We can actually jump in and answer some of these really quickly. Deficient numbers are straightforward because for any prime number p, s of p equals one. So prime numbers are all deficient. Since there's an infinite number of primes, we know there's an infinite number of deficient numbers. What about abundant numbers? We have 12, that's an abundant number. And here are the first few abundant numbers. One pattern is if you take any power of two greater than one and multiply it by three, then that number is gonna be an abundant number. We can quickly show why this works. If you look at the proper divisors of two to the nth times three, you have one, two, two squared on and on up to two to the nth. And then you have three, two times three, two squared times three, on and on up to two to the nth minus one times three. Remember, we're leaving out two to the nth times three because that's not a proper divisor. And if you add up all these divisors, which are two geometric series, you get this expression. When simplified, it's abundant whenever n is greater than one. So there's also an infinite number of abundant numbers too. This isn't all of them, but it is an infinite number of them. That leaves the perfect numbers. We know six is perfect and 28 is perfect. And the next two perfect numbers are 496 and 8,128. Those were the only perfect numbers known thousands of years ago. They did notice the last digits of these perfect numbers alternated between six, eight, six, eight. Also of these four, the first one has one digit, the next one has two digits, the third has three digits, and the fourth has four digits. So they thought that was the pattern, that for any number of digits, there was one and only one perfect number, and the last digit alternates between six and eight. Unfortunately, it turns out this pattern breaks down pretty quickly because the fifth perfect number is 33,550,336. It does end in six, but it does not have five digits. But it was a pretty good guess based on just four examples. This also brings us to an interesting spot. We're just about to the point where no one knows much more than what we've already seen here. We know there's an infinite number of abundant numbers and an infinite number of deficient numbers. But what about perfect numbers? People think there's an infinite number, but we don't know. Also, if you look at the first few perfect numbers, you'll notice a pattern. An easy one is they're all even, but there are other patterns too if you dig in and factor them. Each perfect number is a power of two times a single prime. But this prime number isn't just random, it's actually one less than another power of two. And in fact, it's one less than two to the power of a prime number. If we go back to the time of Euclid, he showed that numbers of this form are perfect if the second part is a prime number. Euler showed that this is true of all even perfect numbers. If an integer is perfect and it's even, then it must take this form. And this prime number here, we call a Mersenne prime. So for every Mersenne prime, you get a perfect number and every even perfect number corresponds to a Mersenne prime. So this brings up the question, is there an infinite number of Mersenne primes? We don't know. All these examples of perfect numbers are even integers, which raises another question. What about odd integers? Is there an odd perfect number? Well, we don't know that either. People have worked on it and have been able to make a little bit of progress and show that if there is an odd perfect number, then it has to have this property or that property, and this whittles down the possibilities. So that's where things are today. 